Hey, Mr. P here. So we are moving out of nucleic acids and DNA structure into a discussion of how this DNA or how these molecules impact an organism's genetics. And so we're not going to talk really in depth about genetics in this video, um, but we need to talk about how we bridge from the molecule itself to uh, how it's structured, which is going to uh, obviously allow it to behave in a way that is going to um, play a role in the inheritance of not only traits but physical characteristics uh, of an organism, uh, including humans. And so um, you can see back here we have the double helix. We talked in depth about the structure of DNA. Remember we talked about each of these being nucleotides and so you would have A, T, C, and G's and the complementary base pairs associated with these letters. And so if you have a guanine on this strand it's going to be hydrogen bonded to a cytosine on this strand and if this is a cytosine it's going to be triple bonded with a G, T is going to be bonded with an A twice, A is bonded with a T twice, and so um, just as a review these remember were hydrogen bonds and those hydrogen bonds are weak which again allows us to unzip this DNA molecule to replicate and transcribe into DNA and RNA um, these would be our phosphodiester bonds. Again, I've gone through this in uh, previous videos, but I'm just using this opportunity to kind of review some of these concepts with you. Um, but you'll also notice that um, there is a section of this DNA that is yellow, and it is specifically this section. Okay, so this section is considered a gene. And what is a gene? A gene is a section of DNA that codes for a particular trait once it's expressed in an organism's phenotype. Okay, And so in this video we're going to talk about how the DNA is structured, what is required to call a certain section of DNA a gene, and ultimately what is that gene coding for? Um, and that would be a trait. Okay, What does the trait mean? trait means that you have a physical characteristic, physical uh, phenotypic expressed quality that that gene codes for. Okay. A few vocab terms to throw at you right away. Okay, In order to understand biology and in order to understand a lot of uh, abstract concepts we have to understand the lingo or the terminology associated with that concept. And so you're going to see four words. Chromosome is this guy. Okay, chromosome, remember, is a structure that is physically composed of DNA and protein. Now, how does a DNA molecule, again, this is DNA, how does the DNA molecule that is made up of T's, A's, G's, and C's twist itself into a double helix and how does that double helix then supercoil, okay, supercoiled, okay, how does the DNA uh, twist into the double helix, supercoil itself, and then package itself into chromosomes that the cell uses in order to, um, to, to organize the DNA in a way that is easily controlled and is easily utilized in order to replicate the cell. Um, and so let's, let's go through a little bit. What actually coils the DNA? There are bonds between the coiled sections of DNA and those bonds are hydrogen bonds. Okay, And so there's bonding that holds the DNA in uh, not only the double-stranded anti-parallel nature, but the hydrogen bonds are actually going to keep the coils together um, in order for it to resemble a spring, uh, if you were to, or a spiral staircase, if you were to look at it um, as an analogy. Okay, that double helix or spiraled structure is going to wrap itself around histone proteins. Histone proteins, remember, are in a set of eight, which makes up an basically an octamer of these histone proteins, the DNA is going to wrap itself around the histone, eight histone complex twice to create a nucleosome. Those nucleosomes are going to supercoil, wrap themselves around each other like, a, like an old-fashioned um, corded phone, okay? Like those old-fashioned uh, foam cords that were coiled. 
Um, why are they coiled? It saves space. It's a lot easier to organize itself that way. It's a lot um, less likely for the foam cords to be tangled. Um, and so they're going to become supercoiled, and that supercoiled chromatin, okay, chromatin is going to again supercoil even further to create a chromosome. So you go from DNA, which is a uh, anti parallel double strand of nucleic acids, they're going to coil themselves uh, once, basically into that alpha helix, double helical structure held together by hydrogen bonds wrap around histone proteins, eight of them, twice to create a nucleosome. Nucleosomes are going to supercoil once into kind of that uh, foam cord structure and then that chromatin, once it's in this form, is going to supercoil again into the basic famous chromosome structure that we uh, associate with DNA uh, all the time. Once it's in this chromosome structure, um, you can begin to look at similar genes, and gene is the second word. Notice all these colored bands. This would be a gene, this would be a gene, this would be a gene, this would be a gene. Okay, what are genes? Genes are heritable factors that control or influence a specific characteristic. So, a gene could be, a gene could control eye color, a gene could control hair color, okay? Am I telling you what eye color this organism has or what hair color the organism has? No, the gene is basically a generic term in a specific location, which is called a gene locus, that controls the expression of a particular trait. Now, alleles are alternative forms of a gene. So we might have alleles that are positive, or I shouldn't say positive, I should say uh, uppercase, okay, capital alleles, which are going to denote dominant alleles. And in, the f in, in eye color, that could be brown, okay? Brown is a dominant trait, it's a, or controlled by dominant alleles. Uh, you could have lowercase, which would be recessive, which is blue, if we can stay with this eye color. Um, and then depending on how those alleles um, assort or how they segregate during gamete formation um, dictates the expression of that particular trait. And so we're going to go through this again in a little bit, but if you get a big A, big A, two dominant alleles, then you can almost assume that you're going to express the dominant trait. If you get heterozygous, a dominant and a recessive, uh, depending on the mode of inheritance, you will often get the dominant, or you'll get a version of a dominant recessive. Now, eye color is multiple alleles, which means it's multiple traits that interact to produce eye color. So it's not just a, you know, kind of a black and white, brown versus blue. Um, but I'm just going to say for the purposes of this that maybe you have a brown ish, or maybe greenish, or hazel eye, and little a, little a, we're going to say is blue. Now, again, I know that this is not exactly how eye color is um, expressed or how it's inherited or how it's passed on. But for the purposes of this, know that uh, these alleles are different forms of the same gene. These alleles are passed on to organisms at that particular gene locus, which is the specific position of a gene on the chromosome, but they are basically the placeholders or the exact or actual DNA contained within that gene, which is eye color. So if you think about like a, a more generic to more specific lens or look at DNA and chromosomes, chromosomes are the actual structure that contains all of your shape. Now you'll notice over here that if this is our chromosome, these bands here denote all these different characteristics. Okay, so I was using this as an example, but we could look even further into like an eye color gene, hair color gene, skin color gene, nose size gene, nose shape, eye shape, hair texture, ear size, widow's peak, ear lobes. Notice that these genes are not saying that this is brown eyes and blonde hair and Caucasian skin color and small nose size. Okay, these are generic descriptors of human traits, human characteristics. 
Now, the alleles associated with this particular eye color will denote a specific trait. For instance, we'll say green or hazel. Okay, this would be the alleles, this would be the gene, this would be the specific gene locus, and this entire structure would be a chromosome. Okay. Chromosomes, remember, we just talked about, are the X-shaped structures. They are condensed, supercoiled strands of DNA. Um, and we've already talked in, in previous lectures also about what exons, introns mean. Remember, introns are ancestral DNA. They're unneeded uh, DNA. We don't need them. We cut them out during RNA processing. They will not ever become expressed um, sections of RNA, which means they're not going to become uh, produced proteins or produced polypeptides. Exons are what is uh, eventually going to be expressed as protein. But again, you can see a different view of these. These are our histone proteins. Remember, the histone proteins are going to result in eight, uh, uh, an eight histone complex. The DNA is going to be wrapped around the histones twice. These histones um, when wrapped twice with DNA become nucleosomes and those supercoil themselves and then wrap them, supercoil them again into a chromosome structure. Okay? Um, the number of chromosomes between species differs, but the number of chromosomes should be the same within a particular species. So in humans case, the number of chromosomes is 46 but the number of chromosomes within a dog or within a fruit fly or within a chicken or a fish would be different than 46. Okay, 46 chromosomes makes us us. Okay, the number of chromosomes in a dog makes a dog dog. Um, let's look at genome size relative to humans uh, because what I would like for you to understand is that there really isn't an association between the number of chromosomes or the number of genes and the complexity or the specialization, if you will, of a particular species. Um, if you look at, first of all, what this graph is showing you, you've got organisms that are listed along this left side. You've got number of protein coding genes, which are the, the genes that are uh, exons, if you will. They're the genes that are going to code for the production of a protein. Those proteins, when produced, are going to become um, expressed traits um, or are going to help express traits. Number of genes, um, basically the number, the genome size divided by a thousand, okay? And then, um, and then we kind of go more specialized as you drop down the graph. And so we've got viruses, which remember are acellular. We've got prokaryotes, which are essentially bacteria. And then we have eukaryotes, which we belong to. And here are the humans. As you move down this complexity, you will notice that for the most part, and I'm speaking generally, the number of protein coding genes are increasing as you get more complex. But you will notice that Homo sapiens only have 21,000 genes that code for a protein. If we compare that to some of these other things, like yeast is a eukaryote, but it only has 6,600 um, nematodes, C. elegans has 20,000, very similar to the number of humans. I would consider humans much more specialized. I think, generally speaking, the, the general population or population of scientists especially would consider um, nematodes to be far um, inferior to the complexity and the structures associated with hum or Homo sapiens. Um, but they have essentially the same number of protein coding genes, which means that the number of protein coding genes really plays no role in the development of an organism that is highly specialized like a human. Let's look further. Fruit fly, 14,000. Pufferfish, 19,000. Corn, 33,000. Again, uh, this is going to be a common theme. You're going to notice that through the, the remainder of this uh, video that there are a lot of plants. Okay, plants, remember eukaryotes. Plants um, often have way more protein coding genes than humans or a lot of other animal. Mus musculus, that's a mouse. Um, again, very similar number of coding proteins to humans. Humans, of course, 21,000. And a wheat, again, a plant has 95,000 
protein coding genes. So what does this mean? For the most part, as you move from viruses to prokaryotes to eukaryotes, the number of protein coding genes are going to increase. But once you get into the eukaryotic um, domain and look at the protein coding genes, you will notice that a lot of times the uh, single-celled eukaryotes, like yeast, are going to be uh, right in line with the single-celled prokaryotes. But once you get into the multicellular uh, eukaryotes, like nematodes and flatworms, and, um, and insects like fruit flies and humans and other mammals like mice are all going to have relatively the same number of protein coding genes which are less than the corn and the wheat which are two examples in this particular graph which are plants. Most of the time plants have a substantially uh, larger number of protein coding genes. Okay? Does that mean plants are, uh, are more complex? Does it mean they're more specialized? Does it mean they're more intelligent? Does it mean they're more adapted to their environment? I don't know, um, but it's a good association to look at and uh, basically the big idea I want you to take away is that there really isn't a, um, an, a, an organizational uh, specializational um, correlation between the number of protein coding genes and the specialization exhibited by that particular organism. Okay. Again, looking at plants, have a very large number of protein coding genes. If we look at a different type of graph, notice that here are your plants. Grape is a fruit that is obviously a plant. Here's kind of a, um, a, an average, so 30,000 protein coding genes or genes associated with a particular genome. Humans, right around 21, 22,000. Other animals and mammals, birds, fish, are going to contain 16 to 17,000 genes. Fruit flies and insects, about 15,000 genes. E. coli and prokaryotes are about 4,000 genes. And viruses are about 11 genes. Okay, very small to substantially larger. Um, but for the most part, humans, which are considered to be kind of the supreme being um, to a lot of people uh, in science fields and away from science fields, uh, consider humans to be you know, far superior and it is not necessarily the case when you look at genome size and protein coding genes.